My month has been largely spent on my brand new Ambonic RG35XX SP. Oh, hello. Yeah. How, if you how last that, month's episode, how did that come you into your heard possession? Three... <laughs> if, if you'd ever. If you got last month's episode, uh, you would have heard Chris waxing lyrical about Ambonic's lovely little GBA SP styled retro device. And because I was listening to him like a good little boy, I bought myself one, had it shipped to his house, had him set it up with his uh, extraordinarily uh, thoroughly crafted emulation collection. And you are absolutely right about this being exactly the sort of hardware needed for this sort of gaming. Yeah. I've, I've been... I've enjoyed playing some of the retro collections on the Switch through Nintendo Switch Online stuff, and and that felt like quite a nice fit because the Switch is relatively lightweight. Uh, but even though the Steam Deck can emulate beefier systems and games, this uh, this this tiny little flip flip flop flip flippity floppity top <laughs> flip top device has uh, really filled a little hole in my gaming activity, and uh, yeah. I just wanted to quickly cover a few of the games that I've blasted through in the last few weeks. What do you think my first port of call was? Um, some sort of RPG from your youth. Yeah. Rayman. Ah, oh, that would have been up there as second or third guess, I reckon. It's, it's, it's such a comfort food game for me. Uh, and even though Saturn emulation is still an ongoing enigma to be truly sold, uh, the Ambonic is, is more than capable of uh, handling PS1 emulation. So I played through the PS1 version of Rayman 1 and had a wonderful time. Uh, there, there are actually a few incredibly subtle differences between PS1 yeah. and Saturn versions. There's a couple of audio visual things being a bit different. Some of the hidden electunes are slightly different. Uh, but by and large, this is the same experience and it was great to play through it once again. And the nice thing about Rayman is that in order to unlock the final world and, and, and do the final boss, you need to have found all of the hidden electunes on the previous level. So you always get to beat the boss knowing you 100% of the game, which which feels lovely. Yeah, yeah. Next up, <clears throat> Asterix on the Master System. Uh, oh, I, I've spoken... A uh, it, well, sort of. I mean, I, I'm, I've spoken about my love of uh, the Asterix books uh, and also my love of, 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 uh, of the, the Asterix games. I just, I just love Asterix. It's great. Uh, and this, this game in particular, uh, which me and my brother had on our Master System when we were kids, uh, there's a physical copy of it on my shelf behind me uh, that that actually belonged to my wife um, in, in a startling display of synchronicity uh, because we found her copy of it when we were clearing <laughs> out uh, some, some of her stuff in her mum's attic. Uh, me and my brother never completed it as kids because as with lots of games of that era, uh, it is tough as nails and pretty unforgiving. Uh, but with save states, uh, to take the edge off, I wanted to give this a proper proper playthrough and, and i was incredibly surprised at actually just how good this game is for starters the sprite work in asterix is amazing for the 8-bit era like I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find better looking sprites and animation in, in any in any game of that era it's, it's utterly gorgeous the yeah. level designs are also really really well designed with a puzzle element to them as well as a standing uh, standard you know platforming and action element most of the levels, you usually need to hunt down a key somewhere in the level to unlock the exit and continue. And this can see you tracking back, finding hidden paths or different routes through the level to find it. You're always on a timer too, which even though it's, you know, it's pretty generous, like, like in Mario games, the, the timer is usually there just to keep your overall score. But in, in Asterix, it caught me out a few times when I was struggling to find the key in the level and I was actually just running the clock down because I just couldn't, couldn't find it. There are some, some really cool, fun mechanics in Asterix too, which just constantly surprised me. That they, they, they weren't, uh, they're not afraid of like throwing in new mechanics pretty late in the game as well, which is, is also part of the unforgiving nature of the game because you don't get many chances to learn yeah. how they work before you'd be killed and have to start the whole game again. Uh, and then I managed to beat the final chariot race level of the game, which is again just a stunning piece of sprite work. It's mad they did this on the Master System. I mean, yes, the frame rate gets shot to bits quite regularly when more than a couple of things are happening at once. But, like, the vision of this game is, is really excellent. And the best part is that you can actually play through the game in two totally different ways, depending on whether you choose to play a level as Asterix or as Obelix. And the levels themselves uh, pretty much stay the same. But because of the difference in mechanics between uh, the two 
goals, uh, you, you have to play the levels then very, very differently. Like Obelix is, is taller, so he can't fit through small gaps, but he's got his powerful punch that can smash through blocks. Asterix is much smaller. He can go through like tighter little gaps. He also gets to carry around magic potions that he can then throw to have different effects in the game that can get rid of certain blocks or make platforms on, on like water and, and things like that. I'm really, really surprised at how much I love this game coming back to it. Like it, it's a really, really good example of a Master System game that does hold up, uh, unlike the shite box that is Alex Kidd in Miracle World. Shame on you. Um, we up. have a very poor connection today. Just as we a do, heads don't up, we? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I, if I'm not reacting to funny jokes, it's because I may not have heard them. That's fine. I'll just, I'll just wait for the laugh. If it doesn't come, <laughs> laugh. I mean, if it, if, <laughs> but if it doesn't come, it could be that you're just sat there. And I'm like, I'm, I'm waiting for this amazing punchline. I just literally have not heard it. So you might get a few like, ha, 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 ha. I'll do some, some uh, Jimmy Carr ad-libs that you can just drop in later. Brilliant. <laughs> Next up, one of my favourite things about emulating games back in day was uh, being able to change the speed settings at which I played them, especially as someone with a penchant mm. for RPGs. Because older RPGs yeah. could be excruciatingly slow. And I'm not talking about like the pacing of the games or the narrative, but just just the individual mechanics of walking uh, menus battles uh, stuff like that would just feel so heavy and cumbersome but with the speed settings an easy option to toggle on and off in emulators uh, i just played through pokemon crystal on the game boy color for a lot like the like all it's of for it. a giggle like the, yeah like the in-game clock had me at about 50 hours but it probably took me about five or six maybe to be all, to be all uh, all eight Johto gyms, the Elite Four, go all the way through Kanto, all of those eight gyms, uh, redo the Elite Four, climb Mount Silver and beat Red. Like, absolutely, I mean, phenomenal game. I then refresh my memory of Dragon Warrior Monsters, which was my other monster-catching obsession on the Game Boy Color, which is it's a really brilliant twist on the formula with like an almost roguelike feel to the way you fight through procedurally generated environments, collecting monsters, breeding them, getting stronger, fighting through the increasing tiers of the tournaments and just rinsing and repeating for days. But once I'd familiarised myself with mechanics again, I took the opportunity to play through Dragon Warrior Monsters 2, which I'd never played, actually. In fact, I've never actually played any up? of the subsequent Dragon Warrior or Dragon Quest Monsters games. But I, I had a fantastic time playing through Dragon Warrior Monsters 2. It's a much more nice. developed game than the first instalment. It doesn't step things up in quite the same way that like Pokemon Crystal did over Pokemon Red and Blue. But but there's certainly a grander scope to Dragon Warrior Monsters 2 with, with larger uh, designed worlds to uh, explore in addition to the smaller, more random dungeons. It's got a much more epic overarching story and a refinement of a few of the mechanics. 50 plus hours of in-game time, two evenings work. Uh, had brilliant time. <laughs> I was then thrilled to see that there was a fan translation of the Japan-only GBA Dragon Quest monsters that I could get cracking on straight away. But unfortunately, I actually just bounced off it quite hard. It's possible that I was just a bit Dragon Warrior monstered out. But the mechanics in the GBA one, um, for the little bit that I played, felt just really too far removed from what I loved about the first two games. I, yeah. I might return to it at some point. Or I might dust off my 3DS and play those entries, which includes a remake of uh, Dragon Warrior Monsters 2, uh, which we, we, yeah. we shall see. Uh, in the meantime, wanting to get my GBA monster catching kicks on, uh, again, just for a laugh, I uh, played through Pokemon Emerald and then Pokemon Fire Red, clocking up about 60 odd hours of playtime <laughs> in, in about 10 hours of real time. <laughs> Pokemon Emerald is brilliant. I think the art design in these GBA games is so lovely, and I think stylistically they are the Pokemon games that actually hold up best. And I remember being a little underwhelmed with them graphically when they were originally released, because I think I had extraordinarily unrealistic expectations of what the GBA was actually capable of. But the, yeah. the level of detail in the pixel art is so nice. There's so many lovely little touches and just bright colours. Uh, it's just lovely to look at. I, I did really, really enjoy Pokemon Emerald. 
there is too much water in the game. Uh, that's 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 an established <laughs> fact. I think it would have been fine if the camera was maybe able to be zoomed further out, uh, so you could yeah. just see a bit more of where you were going. Or as Minty posited a long time ago, uh, that instead of having long grass on the terrestrial sections in the water, you should have long water. <laughs> or deep water. Uh, the, the, so, just so, so you weren't perpetually plagued with random battles as you're trying to find your way around the big blue. But like the only criticism I have of Emerald, uh, certainly over the original Ruby and Sapphire games, or Sapphire in particular, is that it doesn't allow you to get Kyogre or Groudon until the post game because I loved Kyogre. Less fuss on Anthony Groudon, but Kyogre <laughs> is one of my all time favorite Pokemon. Uh, it was just a veritable one man army for the Elite Four. And uh, I, I, the, the, the post game in Emerald isn't, it's, it's, it's fine, but like, yeah, it, there wasn't really the impetus to, 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 to really crack on with that. Pokemon Fire Red is a gorgeous recreation of the original games, complete with all of this gorgeous pixel art that brings the games to life in a way that they probably were in my mind when I was playing them as an 11-year-old. The main game's still really good fun. It's nicely paced and designed. The additional content in these remakes is is really, really good too. And and not just like the quality of life features and the extra mechanics and things like that, but now there's seven islands to explore in the post-game that contain all kinds of secrets and tough battles and, and all, all sorts of stuff. And then you get to re-challenge uh, the Elite Four, uh, who then all have much harder, uh, higher-level parties. And that's just a really, really great final challenge. So, yeah, I, I had a great time. Um, so much RPGing. So little time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in, in this perfect little flip-top handheld. Um, <clears throat> I say, the, the one thing I haven't ended up persisting with is the retro achievements integration uh, with this whole emulator setup on my Ambernic SP. I I, lo I love the idea of retro achievements, and I, I really, well, I, I had it turned on for my playthrough of Rayman and also Pokemon Crystal, and it was it was brilliant to be able to earn achievements in these games. Like, as a, as a system, it just works so, so well. It really yeah. brings a, just a great new modernization to, to some of these games. But the issue I had is that because you have to be online to have the achievements trigger, and I pick up and put down my Ambernic just really frequently when I'm playing that constant sleeping and waking. The device basically puts me in offline mode too often. Uh, yeah, and then it's, yeah. it's trying to reconnect uh, and I'd miss achievements and that made me sad. So I decided just to, to turn off the integration for now because I was getting frustrated that I wasn't clocking achievements when I was. And rather than getting wound up by it, I've just, just put it out of sight and out of mind for now. But all in all, I echo everything Chris said last month. The Ammonic RG35XX SP is just a really, really great little device. There's still a few hardware and software quirks with it, mostly to do with uh, the battery and charging and that sort of stuff, which is a bit weird. But hopefully that might get ironed out. So some of it might get ironed out in firmware updates and whatnot. But yeah, I'm having a great time with it. So thank you to the emulation master over there <laughs> for getting this going for me. I'm really happy you've uh, enjoyed it. Because for a long time, we've, I think, like, collectively, we've been looking for the way that's going to get you more invested and interested in kind of older games. So, mm. you know, we, we set it up on the Steam Deck. Years ago, we set up, like, a Vita for you to kind of have the same experience. We've had all these yeah. kind of different things where it's like, it could, this could be it. This could be the one that's going to get you really, really into it. Mm. And it's taken just something a little bit different as, as the best way to make it work. But, you know, mm. I, I'm, pl I'm playing mine literally every day. Uh, and, yeah. and have done pretty much since I got it, and that's on top of still obviously accessing the Steam Deck. I've got the PlayStation there, anything I need. But it does fulfil a very different kind of gaming mm -hmm. niche and gaming hole, and it's just such a convenient little thing to know that I've got all this kind of retro stuff, all this kind of you know PS One and below emulation stuff is ready to go, set up nicely. There's my library. It's all kind of just you know boot it up, away you go for fifty hours of Pokemon in ten. <laughs> yeah. Magic, uh, absolute magic. I reckon you can probably guess what game I've been playing on mine. Tetris. Oh, it's, it is Tetris. Like, I mean, I'd like to say that I'm getting bored of playing Tetris, but firstly, I'm I'm not. You know, and and secondly, even if I was, this last month I physically have not been able to stop. And and I I promise I'm not just going to talk about Tetris for twenty minutes. But you know, this is the section where we talk oh. about a gaming activity. And at the moment. So, 
a huge amount of it has been Tetris. There's just no way around it. Mm -hmm. So context for the whole story, continuing the Tetris activity I had on the SP last month, I went on to beat SNES Tetris. I beat Virtual Boy Tetris. I beat a few pretty other, a few pretty horrible homebrew implementations of Tetris as well, one on weird formats. And eventually thinking what I was going to play next, I found myself back on one of the OGs that was NES Tetris. And mm. this is the game they use in the classic Tetris championships. It's kind of like the purest Tetris in a way. And it's a game that I had already mastered on retro achievements at some stage in the past. But over the ensuing years, it had had extra goals and achievements added by the community because you can kind of have like set revisions for, for kind of the um, achievement sets. All of the ones that have been added were related to the B mode. That's the one where your well is partly filled with garbage blocks and then you're trying to clear 25 lines by either working through them or around them or, or whatever, just managing your stack. And I think I had four of those challenges left to conquer when I kind of re-picked up the game. All of them were connected just to beating runs on higher speed and higher garbage settings. And I kind of looked and thought, yeah, I can, I can probably do that. And within 20 minutes, I'd beaten the one that was on speed 12 that was quite hard. Uh, I beat the one on speed 14. You know, once I was in, in the swing of it, not too bad. Speed 16, again, no problem. But the final achievement I had left, which was to beat speed 18 at height 3, took, without exaggerating, 45 hours of my life to beat. And you can't do that on fast forward. <laughs> like, that's your next challenge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that 45 hours of attempts as well was often with runs that lasted less than 15 seconds between loading and failing. Just, just to kind of, you can do the rough maths on how many, how many goes yeah. I had. But this was honestly like my Tetris Everest, um, because I was, I was so transfixed on doing it. And every time I'd start and be like, "Come on, let's just, let's just get this done," and then I'd play for three hours, make no progress, and then just have to turn it off again. And it was like a compulsion I haven't felt since grinding out five stars on like expert songs on Guitar Hero or DJ oh, Hero. Wow. Or in my holistic obsession, I had the witness that meant that I did not think about yeah. anything else for the duration I was playing that game. Like I could not put Tetris down and I couldn't pick up either the SP or a controller for my Steam Deck without finding myself just immediately booting up Tetris again. And I'd say to Georgia, like out loud, I'm going to do three more runs, three more goes. And then I'd physically count them down out loud going like, right, number three, no good. Okay, number two, right, number one. And then 45 minutes later, I'd still be going. Uh, it was like a borderline sickness. <laughs> Just uh, awful. Like it took nearly two weeks to beat. And in that time, Jesus. again, not exaggerating, I did not play any other games. Like I put down the game for the night, go and get myself ready for bed. And then whilst doing my teeth, I'd find myself obsessively watching YouTube videos about how to master movement approaches at high speeds or how like on the NES people use these different things called delayed auto shift or hyper tapping which are all like different ways to hold your controller to get just that tiny bit faster when it was a work day I'd, I'd get up half an hour earlier than normal to have a few goes before I left for work <laughs> like I was getting up at half five rather than six a.m to just have a few goes and I cannot say that I enjoyed the grind and yet simultaneously it felt like it was my only purpose and goal <laughs> for that time like I've I, I've never considered myself to have any particularly neurodivergent traits, <laughs> but I absolutely do fall into these pits of hyperfixation sometimes that I cannot get out of. So like this Tetris challenge obviously fits that bill, but also think back to things like the 50 or 60 hours I spent getting Deadly Premonition to work on the Steam Deck. When, when yeah. that episode went out, Georgia listened to it and she was like, you owned that game already on the Switch and you could have just played it there. And I was like, yeah. That and wasn't the she, game, she was she was absolutely gobsmacked at that re that revelation for her that it's like so you wasted all that time to play a game that you could have just put in the console and enjoyed and it's like yeah you know that's just how it is sometimes anyway for tetris i'm very glad this one is done of course i'm already scouting for other tetris games to beat <laughs> because <laughs> the tetraminos still offer a sort of safe space from the toughest bits of the academic calendar especially when it's kind of work time but thankfully once i beat that challenge i have been able to play some other stuff because otherwise this would have been a very very boring episode for people and you know that didn't look like it was going to be the case at the height of my mania when i was like am yeah. i ever gonna beat this am i ever gonna play another game um there was one time i got down to just one line remaining of the 25 and she just said it was the most upset she's ever seen me 
because it was just like immediately I just dropped the controller and then it was just like head Jesus. in hand. Not like Jesus. anger. And your parents have been on the brink of death. I will, I will qualify. They are both. They are both okay. But that is absolutely right. That I've had some had some pretty low times. But you know, maybe Tetris took it. <laughs> oh, anyway, yeah, it's a game that I both love and hate. But it is a game that is thankfully <laughs> done. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> 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 ridiculous 